Uh, for example, if we have equal masses of water in the two samples, then they'll just end up at the middle temperature here, which is 55 degrees. So we could plug in that the temperature is going to change by 25 degrees, and we could plug in the mass and see, and that would tell us the heat change. And what would we plug in for the temperature? Well, we'd want to plug in the temperature that's halfway between 80 and 55, because that would kind of be the average temperature change over that region. And then we could figure out the entropy change for this water uh, by, again, using this Q equals MCAT. And for it, the average temperature would be halfway between 55 and 30. Um, so you could do that as an approximation. However, uh, sometimes at this point, they are going to expect you to figure this out exactly. So for that, we want to use this formula here. So let's briefly see how to do that. So we're going to use this formula where we're imagining splitting up the changes into a bunch of very small intervals. Because over each very small interval, the temperature is approximately constant. Then we have to do a little bit of calculus here. Here's the formula that we would have used in our approximate approach. So what's the formula that we can use for a small interview, interval? If we look at the entire change, the entire heat is mc times the entire, entire change in temperature. But if you just focus on the heat over a very small interval, then that's going to be the mass times c times that small change in temperature. So this is the differential form of this equation. So since we're not using the level equa equation anymore, but the differential form, we would plug it in for dq. Now, m and c are constants. So how can we simplify this integral? You remember from calculus, what can we do when we have constants inside an integral? We don't have any numbers here, but there's a way that we can make this integral a little bit simpler, since these two things are constants. That's what I was going for. That's right. That's kind of similar to what we were talking about a second ago. We talked about how for an isobaric process, you can uh, pull out the pressure from the delta. It's kind of a similar idea here. So basically here, um, we have to find the integral of 1 over t. That means we have to find the antiderivative of 1 over t. I don't know if you remember what the antiderivative of 1 over x is. Any recollection? Don't. I'm thinking, yeah. It's the natural log. log. The antiderivative of 1 over t is the natural log of t. Yeah. Now remember that when you're taking integrals, the integral is the antiderivative evaluated at the final point minus the antiderivative evaluated at the initial point. And then we just have one more trick. There's a way to simplify the difference between two natural logs. Remember what the difference between two logs is. What's a simpler way to write that? Now we have an exact way to figure out delta s when the temperature is changing. So this is our formula for figuring out delta s when the temperature is changing. Uh, and as I said, now that we're ending the, getting towards the end of the semester, I have sometimes seen instructors expecting people to use this calculus-based formula. And calculus is going to start to be a little bit more important in the course. And you're going to have to use this approach next semester for electricity as well. Okay. All right, so again, we saw we could just approximate this by using this formula and just plugging in the average temperature. But we can also figure out the exact temperature change by using this, inter uh, this integral approach. We take a look at the handouts that I gave you. So uh, this was, yeah, here you have entropy. So we just kind of gone over, um, oh, my head is a bit wrong. All right, I should 
that had this header is supposed to be uh, ideal gas processes. And this is the page on entropy. Okay, so we've just gone over these uh, basic ideas. Delta S for reversible constant temperature, reversible changing temperature. For an irreversible process, you think about delta S for a similar reversible process with the same initial and final points. Mm -hmm. And then it goes over how do you find delta S for phase changes and temperature changes. And for temperature changes, there's the approximate approach and the exact approach, which comes from using calculus. Well, maybe we can try uh, one of the problems from uh, one of the practice exams that you brought. Do you, did you bring a copy for yourself? Mm -hmm. So this is the one from spring 2008, uh, problem six. Ah. I think, uh, actually, before we get into that, let's talk about one or two other preparatory things, and then we can get into this. Okay. All right, now, generally speaking here, when we're focusing on thermodynamics, we're focusing on some system. And so we divide the whole universe into the system and its surroundings. So roughly speaking, we can say the universe is equal to the system plus its surroundings. The system is what we're focusing on, and the surroundings is everything else in the universe that we're not focusing on as intently, although maybe we'll talk about that as well. well now we want to talk about the second law of thermodynamics. So the second law of thermodynamics says that for a reversible process, the entropy of the universe doesn't change. And for an irreversible process, the entropy of the universe, well, do you know? What, what happens to the entropy of the universe for an irreversible process? Um, Would it go up or down? It's positive. That's right. Entropy is going up. So the delta S of the whole universe will be positive for an irreversible process. Remember, the entropy is disordered. So this is saying that in a reversible process, the universe's disorder doesn't change. But for an irreversible process, the universe becomes more disordered. In any irreversible process, the universe becomes more disordered. And these are the second law of thermodynamics. The second law of thermodynamics. Do you remember what the first law was? Uh, yeah. Delta U equals Now, we've seen that this basically is telling us about conservation of energy. This is basically telling us about conservation of energy. It's saying that, for example, if you put energy in in the form of heat, it'll either go into delta U or it'll go into the work that's being done by the system. So it's telling us that the total energy doesn't change. However, this doesn't tell us in what direction the universe is going to move. It doesn't tell us, um, uh, in general, uh, what direction things are going to go in. It's just going to say that the energy is going to be the same before and after, but it doesn't tell us what the type of direction the universe is going to tend to move in. Well, physicists like to say that the second law gives us time's arrow, which is a kind of dramatic way of saying that it tells you in what direction things will go. For example, it's telling us that generally things will go in the direction of increasing disorder. Now, reversible processes never exactly happen. They're an idealization. So what this is really saying is that in any real process, entropy increases at least a little. It's only in the ideal case that the entropy wouldn't change at all. So in general, the universe is going to move to increase in the direction that increases entropy. Okay. 
So you can see why in a re reversible process the entropy doesn't change. If, the en if you can move in either direction, that's, it has to be because that the entropy was not changing. Because if the entropy was uh, increasing in one direction, you can't move in the opposite direction because that would decrease entropy. And we can never have a decrease in entropy. Yeah, 